In this episode, we look at the imbroglio surrounding NatWest and their attempt to fire Nigel Farage as a customer. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again with Jonathan Armstrong for another episode of our award-winning Life with GDPR. Jonathan, first of all, welcome back. Thanks very much, Tom. Before we start, can I just say one thing? A few people have reached out to me during our partial summer break to say that this podcast has inspired them to learn more about data protection and privacy and for some of them to even consider a career in this space. So can I just say how, first of all, how humbling that is, but good fortune to you all. It's it's a brave thing to change career, and I'm so glad that we've piqued your interest enough to be considering it. And you As, know who uh, you are. I won't disclose any personal details. Tweedledee said ditto. Tweedledum said <laughs> ditto, ditto. So we are going to reference a UK political type, but not for political reasons, although perhaps everything with this person's name is associated with political reasons, but more in I'm not quite sure what compliance, data privacy, you know your customer and the right to do business or not do business on a non-discriminatory manner. And that is Nigel Farage. So I'm going to first ask you to really explain to the U.S. audience of Life with GDPR, what is the kerfuffle about this time? Yeah, for those of you who are not familiar with Nigel Farage, he was a leading proponent of Brexit. He was also the one-time warm-up man for Donald Trump in his soapbox tours and claims to be a close personal friend of Trump. For full disclosure, say from the start that Farage's politics are not mine, and I'll try and do this in as neutral a way as possible and don't feel that anything that I say endorses Mr. Farage's campaign, please. But where we start with this is it's, is a sort of high-end bank and it's owned by NatWest, which in part is owned by the UK government. And Coots has various royal connections and, as I say, it focuses on high net worth individuals. Mr. Farage had made much of the fact that despite him being on the side of the common man, he had a Coots bank account until Coots told him to take his banking elsewhere. And they gave him a period of time to do that. And they offered him an account with another associated bank. So they weren't kicking him out of the NatWest group. They were uh, removing him, attempting to close his Coots account. Now, Mr. Farage is not a publicity shy individual, and he made various films, social media posts, etc., where he protested at what he called was the decision to debank him. And it seems that the BC got wind of the story and they were told by, quote, a source close to NatWest that Mr. Farage hadn't been debanked and he hadn't been invited to leave Coots for political reasons, but rather because he wasn't in the high net worth thresholds. And people complained about this BC story, which was written by Simon Jacks, a journalist I happen to have worked with on stories before and who I believe is responsible and trustworthy. And eventually it came out that the source close to NatWest was in fact their CEO, Dame Alice. Some might say that's a data breach to start with, in that anybody in an organization shouldn't be disclosing the personal data of customers, and that Dame Allison had done that. I think it also highlights something that I've banged on a bit about in 2023 already, and it's certainly something I'm going to bang on a lot more about in 2023, which is CEO risk, and the fact that many organizations are very good now 
are training employees down the organizations or at least pushing policies their way but they're not so good at training and building a compliance culture into those above the chief compliance officer and that's where a lot of the risk lies if you look at issues like musk etc cetera, etc cetera, this is just another example so dame allison as i say unfortunately shared mr farage's details and then mr farage made a subject access request which we've talked about many times on life with gdpr and he effectively got hold of a set of emails that were internal within the bank saying what they thought of mr farage let's just say they weren't altogether complimentary they weren't as horrendous as mr farage i think wanted or anticipated that they would be but they weren't great either so lesson number two is always watch what you record in emails it is likely that subject access requests will enable people to get hold of them the quick advice i give clients is if you're going to write a controversial email think if it would be better in a phone call instead if you still have to send that email maybe even print it out read it back to yourself and before you start reading the email say judge the email went like this and if that's an email that you're going to be happy to defend in a court of law maybe hit send and if not maybe don't learning point number two i think was the injudicious use perhaps of language in emails now nat west had already had a problem with their data protection compliance and i've been involved with a case that highlighted that particularly so none of this was new and this is a risk that the ceo i think should have known about particularly when it seems she was at least in part responsible and resigned as a result after a board vote of confidence i don't know whether american football is the same as soccer but a vote of confidence normally means that you're out of the door the next day and that's what happened here and the ceo of coots also went and there's pressure under the bank on, on the bank's chairman to go as well there's also been a board statement saying in part that they're going to look at these issues again and then somewhat unusually questions have been asked to the cfo as to whether the bank can withstand the extra cost of subject access requests because guess what after mr farage made his subject access request we're told that uh, according to the cfo hundreds of former and current account holders also made subject access requests mr farage says that he's setting up a website which will help debanked former customers of natwest make subject access requests and take the bank on just as he has done so the cfo has said that she has provided extra resources she hasn't put a number on that but they're investing heavily in responding to those subject access requests that's maybe learning point number three if you think the cost of compliance is high try the cost of non-compliance it's nearly always higher and in data protection that's the case as well and if you think that's not bad enough the financial regulators in the uk have now got involved the financial conduct authority they served a notice on the 9th of august on all uk banks and building societies and some other financial services providers so note not just coots not just nat west every single bank that's subject to fca regulation above a certain threshold has to provide details of all accounts terminated between january 2022 and june 2023 and the regulator wants that entire list by the end of this month and obviously from what you hear other banks are suffering from this subject access request deluge as well now some people say that it takes a bank a six-figure sum to answer a subject access request i.e 
more than £100,000 to answer each subject access request. I find that figure, frankly, incredible. If it is costing them that much, then they're doing something wrong. They're probably holding more data than they should, or they're using algorithms to determine bankability. They're almost certainly doing other things that suggest that they're not following their GDPR obligations. But whatever the figure, answering subject access requests is costly. Answering hundreds of them at once is more costly. And it's not just the cost of gathering the data and identifying it. It's the cost of redacting that data as well. So I think it's a salutary lesson for everybody, really, that the consequences of having battles with people can be significantly greater in these days of GDPR. And you have to make sure that you have proper policies in place, proper procedures in place, and you need to include the CEO and top level management in all of that training and education as well. Lessons that we have here seem to start with a basic course that I taught in the 90s, which was entitled, Don't Put Stupid Stuff in Email. Yeah. I didn't have the word stuff, but this is a PG podcast. <laughs> Perhaps a refresher for our international audience might be appropriate. But the the other thing that strikes me, Jonathan, is I won't, I don't know enough to comment on whether banks either were, didn't think that this applied to them, didn't think about it at all, or just went off on their merry way. But they have real exposure for potential violations and potential violations of their own internal policy if customers were terminated in violation of the bank policy, not in violation of English law, but internal company policy. And there's potentially actionable or actions if the bank violates its own internal controls. And this could be a hugely important lesson for all organizations to understand that even if you think it's good for business, if you've got a policy or an internal control around it, you have to, and you're going to override or violate that. You have to have a business justification. It has to be documented. From what little I knew of the case was certainly not enough. And whatever I may or may not think of Mr. Farage, I think this is a hugely significant case for not only he personally, but some of the lessons you've teased out of this and a huge learning opportunity here. I think that's right. And bear in mind the fact, I'm not suggesting this at this stage because we don't know enough about it. But bear in mind the fact that potentially there are criminal offences in UK data protection legislation. If, for example, somebody makes a subject access request and people delete data, which would be responsive to that request, that can be a criminal offence. And when you've got your CEO involved, and I'm stressing that there's no evidence of destruction of emails here, but when you've got your CEO involved in those sort of cases, then there are what's called consent and connivance provisions under the Data Protection Act, which mean that individual can be liable as well. And I've been involved in a case where a leader of an organization received a caution because he was on notice that his organization might be deleting data responsive to a subject access request. Delete data then went missing. For those of you listening on the podcast, I'm using air quotation marks. But he had already been on notice that his ob obligations included to supervise the response to that request. So these things are really significant in a data protection setting. But they're also very significant if you're in a regulated industry like financial services, like healthcare, because you probably have patient duties, consumer duties, and regulators are definitely pushing those in the UK financial services space. There are new obligations or at least restated and amplified obligations on the financial services sector, which are coupled here. And of course, in a worst case scenario, if you've breached data protection legislation, then the fit and proper provisions of your banking license or whatever may also be reviewed. 
So I agree that this is serious. The data protection aspects are serious. The whole access to banking issues are serious as well. They've got government attention. And of course, the bit of this case that nobody's talking about so much in the public domain is there may be concerns about politicians having bank accounts. These things are perfectly legitimate. The rules say that financial institutions have to look harder at politically exposed persons. They also have to look harder at individuals that have connections or alleged connections to Russian individuals. So much of the activity that banks undertake in this space is entirely legitimate and proper and in the public interest. But they've also got to obey the law in doing that stuff as well. So it is a difficult decision for a lot of financial institutions, healthcare providers, people like that. But they can't just dodge the question. And as you say, one of the core issues is going to be careful communications, making sure that you don't indulge in name calling or unhelpful gossip but the evidence back the decisions that you're taking. I have the distinct impression we may be revisiting this matter down the road. Yeah, my money is on Mr. Farage not being an individual that goes away quietly. So I think we may hear more about it. I can't wait to see what we come up with for next time, Jonathan. Until then. Thank you, Tom. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you so much for listening to the award-winning Life with GDPR. If you've enjoyed this episode, I hope you'll subscribe, rate, and review wherever great podcasts are listened to. Life with GDPR is a production of the award-winning Compliance Podcast Network.